the food hospital has opened its doors again. Last year, we proved that food can be a powerful healer. And now we're back, but this time we're pushing the boundaries. Using cutting-edge scientific research to treat a wider range of conditions than we'd have taken on before. And I'll be investigating what food does for all of our health. The Food Hospital medical team will tackle the diets of some of the UK's most extreme eaters. You really wouldn't want to end up with teeth like that, would you? No, absolutely disgusting. And ask some of you to become human guinea pigs. Stopping at nothing to find the amazing properties of everyday foods. Cosetin rich onions have a, a significant effect on reducing blood clotting ability. Using food rather than pills to treat everything from arthritis and insomnia to obesity and Tourette's. It's time to eat our way back to health. Tonight, the food hospital serves up food prescriptions to try to fight alopecia and ADHD. I've got a short attention span. And I just summed it up for you. I've got a short attention span. OK. Plus, an extreme eater who's not just getting five, but 50 a day. Yeah, it's a very natural way of eating, like a monkey, basically. It does, so, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and Dr Pixie McKenna's grazing on greens, all in the name of science. Today, I'm going to learn more about the unsung hero of the salad world, watercress. This series, the food hospital is out and about, dissecting the nation's eating habits. Getting kids to entertain the idea of a plate of greens can be the bane of many parents' lives. So Lucy has come to Yulebury Scout Centre in Oxfordshire to conduct an experiment. She wants to find out if peer pressure from older scouts might convince the younger ones to give veggies a try. Who here hates spinach? Oh. 80% of children aren't eating enough veg. The vitamins, minerals and fibre they contain are essential for development now and for preventing chronic diseases later in life. Tomato. <laughs> but getting kids to eat their greens isn't always the easiest task. Who here hates carrots? I hate carrots so much because when you eat them, it's really stringy. I mean, all of it tastes a bit like rubber. Who hates broccoli? Me. <laughs> it's Whoa. disgusting. It's green. <laughs> Broccoli's weird. Just eating like a tree. Peas. <laughs> oh. I think I'm going to puke if I hear that again. It tastes a bit like mushy. Lucy's identified the group's worst culprits. For these three, certain greens are definitely off the menu. Spinach, Brussels sprouts. I don't like cauliflower. Mushy peas, I hate. Uh, leeks. Cabbage. <laughs> Mushrooms. Is that one? Mm. Like that. Henry, Grace and Sam are definitely fussy eaters when it comes to veg. Getting them to even entertain the idea of a plate of greens could be quite a battle. But Lucy's got an idea. Psychologists suggest that peer pressure can get fussy eaters to eat their veg. Well, I'm going to put that to the test. A recent study by Bangor University showed that observers, in this case the younger scouts, are most likely to imitate the behaviour of others when they like or admire the person performing the behaviour. In particular, studies suggest that older peer influence on food acceptance can be stronger than adult influence, including their own parent. So Lucy's enlisted four older scouts who do like their veg to help her out climbing experts 19-year-old Camillo and 18-year-old Harry, and artistic bods Chloe, who's 15, and 13-year-old Hannah. Right, thank you so much for coming down today. What we've got to do 
is to try and convince the younger kids to eat their greens, okay? So I really need you guys to help me do that. The first step is to actually inspire the kids and get them in awe of you. Okay, so we've got one girl in particular called Grace. Now, I know Grace doesn't eat carrots, so your job of the day is to inspire her and leading by good example, get her to eat her carrots at tonight's dinner. With you two, we've got two boys. We've got Sam, who doesn't like peas, and we've got Henry, who doesn't eat broccoli. Okay? Oh. Ready. <laughs> it's dib, 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 dib time for the Elder Scouts. Find out later if leading by example will be enough to persuade our veggie haters to become veggie lovers. Try a little bit of everything. Even if you don't like it, that's not a problem. You're sounding like my mum now. <laughs> Arriving at the food hospital is a teenager with a condition that threatens to shatter his dream of becoming a professional footballer. My name's Ezra and I'm from Brixton. Calm. 14-year-old Ezra has ADHD, Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. Symptoms include hyperactivity, impulsivity and difficulties concentrating, and it affects up to 5% of UK school children. At home, Mum Michelle struggles to cope with her son's symptoms. Why are you, why are you wearing my top? <laughs> Don't wear my top, bro. Like many ADHD sufferers, Ezra has violent outbursts. This is his door, what he vents his frustration on, as you can see. We have holes in it. It's hanging off the hinges. And his wall, he's sort of like started to repair the damage that he's done to his wall. But I think he ran out of filler. He fidgets a lot. He'll do, he'll move from one like thing to the still. next. I don't like sitting still in it. That's it. I got a short attention span. And I just summed it up for you. I got a short attention span. Okay. A year ago, Ezra was prescribed the common ADHD drug atomoxetine, but stopped taking it because in his case, he found it increased his anxiety and aggression levels. Thank you. I'm already Since then, he's been excluded from school for disruptive behavior, and Mum Michelle is worried he might end up in jail. If they're not taught and they keep getting excluded, excluded, eventually they get into crime. In fact, surveys show that up to 60% of UK prisoners have ADHD. Go. The one place Ezra does excel is on the football pitch. Keep your momentum going so you never stood still. But despite cooking him healthy food, Michelle wonders if her son's unbalanced diet could hinder his football and make his ADHD worse. I know he eats chicken and chips. I know he buys fizzy drinks when he's not at home. So, yeah, I'm finding it quite difficult to control what he's eating. Recent cutting-edge research suggests that diet really can make a difference to people with ADHD. Eating the right foods may improve their brain function, as it can reduce symptoms like hyperactivity, impulsivity and poor concentration, all of which could cause problems for Ezra on his beloved football pitch. In fact, it's believed eating certain foods can help children with a range of behavioural problems. First, dietitian Lucy Jones wants to get the lowdown on Ezra's current diet. What do you tend to have as snacks? Chris. Chris? Anything else? Chicken wings. Do you eat sweets? Yeah? And how much would you eat, say, in a week? About 20. Two or three packets a day? Yeah? It's quite a lot. Lucy decides to go for a two-pronged attack. Some of the e-numbers in Ezra's snacks have been found to aggravate ADHD symptoms, so Lucy wants him to cut them out. The ones to watch out for are the artificial colourings found in some brightly coloured sweets, cakes and soft drinks, as well as the preservative sodium benzoate that's added to some fizzy drinks and squashes. We're going to try and wean you off sweets, OK? We're still going to give you things that have got sugar in, because obviously you need it for energy, but we're trying to avoid all these colours and flavours and basically everything that's artificial in them. Because actually, guidelines to do with the condition you've got suggest that 
a lot of these e-numbers and things like sodium benzoate can actually impact on your behaviour and make things worse for you. So that's one of the things we want to start tackling. Lucy's second prong of attack is to try and improve Ezra's brain function by reducing the bad fats in his diet, which come from the kinds of fried chicken he eats up to four times a week. Obviously, this chicken is deep fried. You get so much oil in just one piece of chicken. Lucy wants Ezra to replace the bad fats in his greasy takeaways with the good fat omega-3. Tests revealed Ezra's omega-3 levels are low. Recent studies have found that omega-3 could help many parents with unruly kids, improving concentration and behaviour in youngsters. To make it easy, Lucy prescribes him an omega-3 supplement. But if you want to increase your levels with food, oily fish, some nuts and seeds are all rich sources. And to give Ezra a fighting chance of success, Lucy's got one last trick up her sleeve. You are out and about and you need to get takeaway. And I'm not recommending this as a daily thing. What might be a better option for you is going and getting a shish kebab. It does have less oil in and it's got some complex carbs in terms of the pitta and it's got some salad. What do you reckon? It's actually nice. Is it? Do you like that? Will you give up chicken and chips for me? Yeah. What do you think is going to be most difficult for you? It's the sweets. Yeah, the sugar intake, yeah. <laughs> I think he's going to have a tough time taking on what we have asked him to do. I think it's going to be a huge change for him. I feel kind of excited about to see if it will change my behaviour and my football. Lucy wants Ezra to return to the food hospital after seven weeks on his new diet plan. I'm Dr Pixie McKenna. Throughout this series, I'll be tracking down the real heroes of the food world. From a root vegetable that may provide the ultimate energy boost, to a spice that could potentially take on cancer. Tonight, I'm looking at a potential super salad. In my weekly quest for food heroes, I've come across a headline. Watercress may help prevent gym workout damage. Gym workout damage? What's that all about? And what on earth can watercress do about it? To find out, I've come to this watercress farm to replicate part of a groundbreaking study done by Edinburgh Napier University. It suggests that watercress may protect against cell damage in the human body. So far, it's all rather strange. They've asked me to have a large bowl of watercress for breakfast and pack my gym kit. What have I let myself in for? Morning. Morning. I'm hoping Dr. Mark Fogarty, who led the study, will reveal all. Yeah, what are we doing? Well, if you can take some blood out of me, I'll take a little bit of blood out of you. I'm like a walking, talking blood bank, but it's all in the name of science. So I'll just take one for the team. Yep, job done. So, what are you going to make me do next? We're going to do a little bit of exercise and cause some DNA damage. What? Is exercise bad for us? Normally, we only hear that things like smoking and sunbathing can damage our DNA. Well, strenuous exercise can produce unstable molecules in our blood. What we're talking about is free radicals, an abundance of which can damage our DNA. But, as a GP, I would say that the pros of exercise on your overall health far outweigh the cons, especially combined with a good diet. So, don't throw away your gym kits. As Mark and I sweat it out to our absolute limits, free radicals start to build up in our blood. It sounds horrific, but I'd rather do this than puff on a cigarette or sit in the sun to test the theory. Watercress is extremely high in antioxidants, which cancel out free radicals. So, eaten ahead of exercise, has it kept the DNA damage in me at bay? I'm done. I'm out. After spilling yet more blood in the name of research, Mark analyzes the DNA in our white blood cells, and later I'll find out for myself whether it really is a hero of the salad world.
next to arrive at the food hospital is a woman from Northumberland who dreads seeing her reflection in the mirror. I'm Jane Waddell, I'm 31 years old and I have a condition called alopecia universalis. Less than 2% of the UK suffer from alopecia. Some people lose hair in patches. Others, like Jane, lose all their head and body hair. And although the hair loss causes no problems to physical health, it can dramatically impact confidence and self-esteem. I don't particularly like, um, like the way that I look in the mornings. Some mornings you'd quite easily just go back to bed and hide for the day. Um, it's not nice to wake up to. Jane's hair fell out in small patches in her first year of university, and by the time she was 21, she was totally bald. I have to do a certain amount of work to get me looking like the average normal person walking down the street. If I don't go through this rigmarole every day, I would sometimes get pointed at and I would get stared at. So I don't necessarily want to have to put up with that on a daily basis. Desperate for her hair to grow back, Jane scoured the internet and has tried almost every miracle food and elimination diet going, systematically cutting out many of the major food groups and putting her body through the mill. If I could manage my condition through diet, I feel like I could just live again. Whilst the food hospital team can't treat the alopecia directly, they're keen to make improvements by getting Jane off the fad diets and onto a much more nutritious plan including all food groups to help her immune system and improve her overall health. Jane seeing Dr Gio Maletto. Let's, let's take a look then. <laughs> there you are. How do you feel? Very vulnerable. We think that it is an autoimmune disease, uh -huh. meaning that the body's own immune system is attacking itself mm -hmm. and basically killing off the hair follicle where it grows. Mm -hmm. It causes inflammation. And that inflammation results in the uh, hair loss because it interrupts the normal growth phase. Mm -hmm. And of course it can potentially regrow, but it's very unpredictable. So the food that we want to use to try and treat your hair loss, mm -hmm. uh, we're calling uh, an immune support plan. Okay. okay, And the purpose of that is to get your immune system um, kind of working optimally and try and reduce some of that inflammation around the hair follicle, okay? okay? I should say that this is experimental. Yeah, no, I understand that. I've been told to keep my feet firmly on the ground. There's no, no miracle cures anyway. I've had it for long enough, so... Yeah. Just fingers crossed it works. Before deciding on the diet plan, dietitian Lucy wants to know exactly how Jane's been tackling her condition on her own. So what have you done recently in terms of changes? Recently I cut out bread and pasta, gluten-free, wheat-free sort of diet. Eliminating wheat and gluten from your diet is actually really complicated yeah. and difficult to do in practice. Mm -hmm. It became almost like an obsession. You end up sticking to certain foods because you're... Safe foods. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So your diet was getting quite restrictive. Absolutely. Just picking on certain foods, not Absolutely. necessarily getting things from all the food groups. Yeah. <laughs> Lucy thinks Jane's going about it all the wrong way. I think you've been a huge victim of an abundance of information. But actually, what we need to do now is get you back to basics and eating healthily. OK. What I want to do is actually give you a menu plan that's going to be like a spa treatment for your body. OK. We need to wrap you up in some loving yeah. and give you an immunosupport plan. This diet isn't just good for Jane, but anyone who wants to support their immune system, especially those with a cold or feeling run down. In fact, it's an excellent diet for all-round general health. When your body's fighting something, it needs nutrients from every food group. Ideally, a third should be carbohydrates, a third fruit and vegetables, 10 to 15% protein, 10 to 15% dairy, and never more than 5 to 7% for high fat and sugar foods. And all of this is what makes up a healthy diet, but all of those food groups are actually vital for your immune system as well. And I think we've got to start focusing on the foods that you're eating actually being good for you, rather than all the conflicting advice and the false hope yeah. that eliminating a food group here or avoiding this there has done so far. Yeah. 
I really enjoyed it. I found it informative. So I'm gonna give it my all and, and hopefully, fingers crossed, something comes of it. It's exciting. Lucy wants Jane to return to the food hospital after 10 weeks on her immunosupport plan. Four out of five kids in the UK don't eat enough vegetables, which puts their future health at greater risk. It's no real surprise, but it's a truth dietitian Lucy Jones is trying to tackle. There are actually huge implications in not eating enough fruits and vegetables. One of which is things like gaining weight and becoming obese, another of which is getting cancer. If you don't eat enough vegetables, the rest of your diet is made up of foods that tend to be higher in fat, higher in sugar and lower in fibre. So it throws the balance completely out of whack. Lucy's paying a visit to a young scout troop where she's identified three committed veggie haters. Eight-year-old Sam, Henry, who's 10, and 11-year-old Grace. With the help of scout leader Alison, she's enlisted some older, green-loving super scouts to help test the theory that peer pressure can convince the younger scouts to eat their vegetables. So we have got Camillo here, and he's going to go up Jacob's ladder. And we also have Harry here. He's going to do the leap of faith. OK, Camillo, go! Go on! Oh. oh my god, he's oh, really at the top. I know. Keep going, Camilla, it's awesome! Yeah. Yeah. Brilliant! Research has shown that older kids can be more influential on their younger peers. The fact that the older scouts are nailing the activities should build up admiration for them from the younger kids. Younger scouts Henry and Sam are suitably impressed with their newfound superheroes, so it's up to the older girl scouts to find some common ground with veggie hater Grace. They've discovered she's more the arts and crafts type, so they're getting creative in order to win her over. Are you done with the frame? But the real test for everyone will be at the dinner table, where each scout has been given a variety of food, including some of their biggest pet hates. <laughs> First to face her demons is 11-year-old carrot hater Grace. Go try some carrots. Yeah. Oh, come on, they're good. So try a little bit of everything. Even if you don't like it, that's not a problem. You're sounding like my mum now. <laughs> but Lucy's not giving up on Grace that easily. Hello. What stops you from trying things on your plate? If it's stuff that I've tried before, like carrots and stuff, and I don't like it, and I don't really try it again. Do you know, the body adapts to trying new foods, and sometimes people have to try things ten times, and then they like it. I'm serious. I would be interested to know if it tastes different to when you last tried it. All right, I'll have a small piece. Chew. Chew I'm it. chewing. I'm chewing. Yeah, chewing. I'm chewing. Yeah, I'm chewing. And it's got a bit of a rubbery sort of taste. But not as bad? No. And you see, what you'd find is each time you had it, the taste would improve. And eventually you end up really liking things. And the trick is to keep trying it. That's quite a, a really big step. I'm very impressed. It's not the greatest start, but it is a success of sorts. What about 10-year-old Broccoli hating Henry? What have you guys been up to today? We've, um, we started off getting Jacob's ladder. Yeah. yeah? Did you see Camillo do it? Yeah, you're really fast. You know what can you do if you want to do it like, better? You're going to eat lots of broccoli. Perhaps not the most subtle of approaches. Have you tried with something else, like with sausage or something like that? OK, here it goes. But it's done the trick. Good. Still can taste it. Our older super scouts did so well in getting Henry to try broccoli, and this time round, he still doesn't like it. But like Grace, hopefully by giving broccoli a few more chances, Henry will come round. I'll show you my pee face. What's your pee face? <laughs> yeah. The younger the child, the more receptive they are to peer pressure. So the older scouts should stand a better chance with eight-year-old Sam. You could try and make like a sandwich. The sandwich with the most stuff on it. All right. Chuck peas in there. I like peas. Peas are good. <laughs> yeah, just give it a try. Nice work. Is it good? Mm-hmm. Do you like peas now? Mm, yeah. Yeah, they're growing on you? 
make you nice and strong, Peter. Sam started off by beautifully demonstrating his pee face, but now has decided he loves them and demonstrated that by having a whole fork full. But if faced with further resistance, Lucy's got other veggie-loving tricks up her sleeve to get clean plates all round. Try growing your own to get them involved. Get creative at mealtimes and make it fun. Arrange plates in pretty patterns and pictures with all the foods. Praise and reward. You could even try a star chart for eating fruits and veggies. It's breakfast time in Brixton. So it's just one of each a day, Ez. And 14-year-old Ezra is taking his daily omega-3 supplement for his ADHD. Prescribed by dietitian Lucy, she hopes it will decrease his hyperactivity levels. Hey! Yeah, what are you having for breakfast? Mum Michelle's pleased to see Ezra's polished off last night's home-cooked meal. Ezra ate his dinner. He didn't eat any junk food last night. But as he pours sugar over his cereal... I think that's going over the top. Mum Michelle's not convinced sweet-toothed Ezra's sticking to the rest of Lucy's rules. Did you have any sweets yesterday? Yeah. You had sweets? You know that's not part of the diet. Yeah? Ezra's struggling to give up the additive-filled sweets and fizzy drinks that medical studies have found can exacerbate his ADHD symptoms. Are you mad, cuz? You know you're going to have to have more willpower. Yeah. Ezra's not only taken his eye off his diet, he's also taken his eye off the ball and failed to show up to his football training session with coach Melvin. And you're now 15 minutes late. Haven't been able to get in contact with Ezra. It's a real disappointment because he wants to be a professional footballer. The first thing you need to be able to do is turn, like, turn up on time. But, you know, what can you do? Is Ezra's dream of playing professional football strong enough to make him stick to his new diet in the hopes of improving his ADHD and, as a result, his game? Find out later when, hopefully, he returns to the food hospital. cancer is the UK's second biggest cancer killer, but eating plenty of fibre is believed to lower your risk of developing it. Last week, when identical twins Dean and Mark Chapman took part in our poo race, oh, we showed that removing just five grams of fibre from Dean's diet added almost 20 hours to his gut transit time. You can almost feel it like coming up the stomach and thinking, so you're not digesting this at all. Eight out of ten of us Brits don't eat the recommended 18 grams of fibre we're supposed to eat each day. And as a nation, we're more than a bit shy when it comes to talking to the GP about our toilet habits. The quality and type of our stools, or poo to you and me, can be an indicator of how well our insides are working. And yet very few of us know what's normal. So we've launched a fibre challenge to get the nation talking about poo and adding extra fibre to our diets. A variety of volunteers have taken on the challenge and will share their experiences, good and bad. This week, volunteer Sarah is beginning the challenge. For her, bowel health is particularly significant. I decided to do the fibre challenge mainly because my mother passed away of bowel cancer, so um, that means I might develop bowel cancer later on in life. So to be able to take part in this challenge and to be actually actively doing something for my own health and for my own bowels is, is, um, is a good thing to do. So um, today I'm cooking a bean, what was it, bean vegetable curry. So I'm using brown rice, some sweet corn and a can of mixed beans. Yeah, so I'm only sort of three days in now, so I don't think I've noticed much change in my digestive system, apart from maybe a bit more gas. <laughs> I think Louise is worse than me, to be honest. <laughs> and here's our bean curry. Cheers. Cheers. 
this series, the food hospital doors are open to the nation's most extreme eaters. And tonight, a man who plows through around 18,000 fruits a year. My name is Maren. I'm 30 years old. I'm from London, and I'm a fruitarian. You're considered fruitarian if your diet is based primarily on fruits, usually 75 to 100% of your daily calorie intake. Forget five a day, guitar tutor Marin eats 50. He was happily vegan for 10 years before becoming fruitarian. I don't think eating meat and dairy products is a very natural way of eating because it doesn't occur in any other species. There's no other species cook their food or eat products from other animals. I just don't think it's in accordance with nature. Nature-loving Marin wants to know if his extreme diet is having any repercussions on his body, so he's come to the food hospital to meet Lucy Jones and consultant Shaw Summers. Would you show us what you eat in a, a typical day? Perhaps? Yeah, I've got a bag here. So I've got uh, my mangoes. Four in a day. Four, yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. I've got bananas. How many have I got here? Twelve. I've got four nectarines. I've got some dates here. I've got six dates. Um, in the evenings, I'll have a salad. Normally, I have quite a bit more than this. And then, drinks wise, I've got my juice. And then, I've got coconut water. Okay. Yeah. And this is it for a day? Yeah, that's roughly it for a day. So, tell us the reasons for being a fruitarian. Um, I just, for myself, I find it really clean and, and very uh, simple. It's, it's, very, it's a very natural way of eating, it's like a monkey, basically. It so, does, yeah. <laughs> Most of the time, we're encouraged to eat more fruit and veg, but from looking at the food Marin's brought in today, his diet could be seriously lacking in protein and minerals, so his bone health may be at risk. So we put you through our body scanner yeah. to look at your bones and your body composition. Interestingly, it showed that you've got a bone age of around 50 to 55, which is oh, not yeah. quite what we'd expect. Wow. Although his high bone age could be down to other factors like genetics, it seems eating like a chimp might not be the wisest choice for Marin. Good non-animal sources of protein and calcium for him would be pulses, tofu and almonds, and there's another aspect to his fruitarian diet that concerns Shaw and Lucy. We've analysed your diet and 81% of your diet was coming from just sugar. Yeah. That's Whoa. a lot. Yeah. That's a lot. That's half a bag of sugar a day equivalent in natural fruit sugars. And that transit of sugar through your body means your body has to respond by producing a lot of insulin. Yeah. And those swings will be really quite dramatic. Now, as a young man, your body will probably cope with it perfectly well. In your 50s, I think you might struggle right. because it is possible that as you age, you might become less tolerant of sugar, and that is a condition that we call pre-diabetes. Pre-diabetes, or glucose intolerance, is often described as the grey area between normal blood sugar levels and diabetic levels. The sheer quantity of fruit and veg Marin's eating means not only is his sugar intake exceeding recommended levels, but blood tests reveal that there is also a surplus of iron, often found in foods he eats like spinach and kale. When we looked at your iron levels, we know that you eat about three times the recommended daily allowance for iron. Yeah. So you have got extra iron floating around your bloodstream. Our bodies can only use a certain amount of iron, and any excess collects in the liver and other vital organs. Marin is happy that he's getting a decent amount of the vitamins and minerals he needs, but Shaw's worried he could actually be getting a bit too much of a good thing. At the moment, you are healthy. Whether that's the same in 10 or 20 years' time, well, I'm not sure. If I feel, still feel good, I'll keep well, doing it. Like, like all things in medicine, things are fine until they're not. Yeah. This kind of dietary regime is clearly what Marin wants to do. He's happy doing it. He seems to be getting all he craves from his food. For most of us, we like eating other food groups, and we're perfectly healthy doing so. I, I wouldn't ever recommend somebody turn fruitarian for the basis of health. But for Marin, being fruity is just what comes naturally. It's such a habit. It's such a way of eating. I'm happy to keep eating this way, and that's fine. Mm. <laughs> 
Seven weeks have passed since Ezra came to the food hospital with ADHD. He'd been excluded from school and mum Michelle was struggling to cope with his violent outbursts. His condition was putting at risk his dream of becoming a professional footballer. Lucy recommended he cut out the potentially harmful E-numbers found in some of Ezra's sugary snacks and improve his brain function by reducing the bad fats in his diet and increasing his omega-3 levels. Now Ezra's returned and Gio and Lucy are keen to find out if he's followed the dietary advice. When I saw you last time, you were having about four or five takeaways a week in terms of deep fried chicken and yeah. stuff. What do you think you're having now? I ain't had it. You're not having it at all? And what other changes have you made? The sweets and drinks. Ah, it's music to my ears, it's music to my ears. I remember last time you were having about three packets a day. Sometimes I don't even have a day. Do you think you're eating healthier? Yeah. When he's hungry, instead of going and buying foolishness, I've got kippers, he'll have kippers and toast maybe, maybe egg and toast. Um, so he's actually taking responsibility now for what he eats. And also, I think he's also thinking about more about what he's doing before he does it. Yeah, so we've got um, some questionnaires that uh, your mum did and uh, your trainer, Melvin. Michelle, this is your questionnaire and this is the one you filled out originally. These questionnaires are official ADHD rating scales. 18 behavioural symptoms are scored on a severity scale. Originally, you ticked 13 of the boxes in terms of behaviours that were occurring very often. Michelle and Melvin filled the questionnaires in before and after the diet. Second time round, none of those boxes were ticked. The final average score shows an amazing 60% improvement in Ezra's behaviour. So that's, that's a real positive, I think. He has been a lot calmer since he's been on the diet, yeah. Less chaotic. Ezra's improvements could also be a result of the omega-3 fish oil supplements Lucy put him on. His initial levels of omega-3 were low, but his new blood tests show his levels are up. Do you feel any different? Yeah. When I play football. You feel what, like your performance is better? Yeah. That's kind of the same as what Melvin, your football coach, was saying, Ezra. That he thought that you were more on time, that you are paying attention more. Yeah. It's impressive, to be honest. Anybody at this sort of age to make a big dietary change is difficult. Yeah. So you've done well. It certainly seems like Ezra's football has given him the motivation to keep going with Lucy's diet. In the last few weeks, I've noticed that he's more focused. We've had less of him having tantrums and punching the doors, kicking the doors. Normally, I would be shouting at him a lot, and he would be like, Mom, you're always on my case. You're just on my case. But yeah, I haven't been on his case that much, according to him. <laughs> Everyone said they noticed a difference in my behavior. And I don't, really, I don't really know if there's a difference in my football yet until I play a match because that's what really matters. If he sticks to the new regime off the pitch, those dreams of making it big on the pitch could become a reality for Ezra. Today, I'm looking at the potential antioxidant properties of the unsung hero of the salad world, watercress. So these should be the exercise. Dr. Mark Fogarty from Edinburgh Napier University is investigating whether watercress can protect DNA from damage caused by strenuous exercise. Earlier, I had a hearty bowl of watercress for breakfast, while Mark had none. And then we both subjected ourselves to a gruelling exercise session. I'm done. And if that wasn't bad enough, Mark took samples of our blood before and after to see if my cells were more protected than his. How are you doing? Both our cells were subjected to an electrical current. The electricity scatters any damaged DNA so that it's easier for us to see our results. First up, Mark. So this side are my cells from pre-exercise. Okay. And this side are my cells from post-exercise. Post this cell is very badly damaged, whereas this one is pretty much really well intact. Healthy. I'll take Mark's word for it. Now, let's have a look at mine. Pretty well intact. So my cells look good to you? They look excellent to me, yeah. 
It must take a trained eye, because all I'm seeing is fuzzy dots on the screen. So Mark's provided us with some results from his main study. This is what white blood cells look like in a healthy volunteer before exercise. Having eaten watercress after exercise, the volunteer's white blood cells look almost the same. But on the day he didn't eat watercress, on the right-hand side, the amount of DNA damage is clear to see. These fuzzy edges are actually damaged strands of DNA from the white blood cells themselves. This apparent ability of antioxidants in watercress to combat free radicals is getting scientists excited. But not just because it's a good food to have before exercise. Cigarette smoke, air pollution, sunlight, you know, poor diets, those all cause an increase in free radicals. So if we can use or get a better understanding of foods like watercress that are very, very high in antioxidants, we can perhaps then start to look at different interventions for different disease. For example, types of cancer are known to be associated with increased free radical generation, cardiovascular disease, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's. So it seems that watercress does have some very powerful antioxidant properties. Not only does it prevent the build-up of free radicals after vigorous exercise, scientists believe that it may reduce the risk of some cancers. For protection against free radical damage, make sure to eat a large portion of watercress about two hours before a workout. And for long-term benefits, try to include it or other antioxidant-rich foods such as cabbage and broccoli in your daily diet. It's ten weeks since Jane came to the food hospital seeking help for her alopecia universalis. She wasn't expecting a miracle cure for the all-over hair loss condition, and Lucy and Gio were unable to prescribe one. But what they did do is urge her to stop the elimination diet she'd tried treating it with, and instead eat a nutrient-rich one. Now she's returned, and Gio and Lucy are curious to find out if there's been any changes. Jane, welcome back. Tell us uh, how you found the dietary changes that you've introduced. It showed how, how badly I had been eating, like I hadn't been eating structured set meals for, for quite a long time actually, so it definitely enlightened me on that, on that side of things. Anything else had any changes? Yes, I think, um, I think I have a small bit of hair growth. There's something happening beneath the surface. So, can we take a look? Yes, you All can. Right. Okay, so tell us where there looks like there might be a bit so, more hair. Yeah, just okay, here. just on your temple mm. area, there are some darker, longer hairs. Certainly, I can see that you've got some hair um, above your ear here. Yeah, and you didn't have that before. No. Okay. So let's take a look at these new hairs. Um, there we are. Oh yeah. So that is really wasn't there the first time around. So we're looking at all that hair on the temple area there. Oh, definitely. Wow. Oh, that's unreal. Yeah. There was nothing yeah, there before. And look, Do you know what's no. growing through? Under the microscope ten weeks ago, there was hardly a single hair on Jane's head. Now there are small, yet noticeable patches, but Gio and Lucy don't want to jump to conclusions. I guess we have to be realistic in the sense that we can't say that the diet is curing your alopecia, mm -hmm. but I think it's fantastic that we've got you eating healthier and concurrently there yeah. appears to be some new hairy growth. I think yeah. that's really exciting Absolutely. for you. I can't wait to see actually nine, ten months down the line to and get to it. a year and see yeah. what happens, yeah. It's a long road for you ahead, isn't yeah. it? But are you going to stick to the changes that oh, we've made? Absolutely, yeah, of course I will. So it's especially when you can see when I can see such a, a positive reaction. It's, it's a biggie, yeah. Very positive, happy. <laughs> How can you not be happy? You know, to, ch to change your diet, feel better within yourself. And it's too much of a coincidence in my eyes, you know, with hair growing. 
I was really tentative when I first met Jane as I really, I didn't want to offer her false hope. But meeting her again today, her whole persona is different. She had more energy, she's feeling good down to eating a healthy diet and there's hair regrowth. So I'm absolutely thrilled for her. Next time, a young man whose social life is blighted by severe acne. That's obviously a pustule in glorious close up. Yeah. The cola addict breaking a six litre a day habit. You really wouldn't want to end up with teeth like that, would you? It's disgusting. And we're taking a look at pee. What our urine can tell us about our health. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Got a little waft there. <laughs>